Now that we've learned a little bit about the C programming language in our previous lecture, I want to introduce a few things that you can do with C. In the first part of this lecture, we will learn about how to use some assembly code that you're already familiar with within C language code files. And then we'll also talk about some of the macros that are built in. So in general, you're not going to need to write a lot of assembly code once you transition over to C, but occasionally you might want to do some specific things that you know how to do in assembly that might be a little bit trickier to do in um, the C environment. So for example, if you wanted to go ahead and put a literal value into W, you could do that this way with ASM, open paren, double quote, move literal into W, and then whatever that literal value would be, in this case hexadecimal 7. Notice this dash is just a bullet on there, that's not part of the code. Um, you could also move something over to port B if you wanted to do that. Um, why you would want to do that, uh, really if you just wanted a no-op or something like that, that might be useful. But for the most part, a lot of the commands that you have, it would be a lot easier for you to go ahead and just use the C language. So some notes on that, in the ASM function your argument has to be a string, so you do need these double quotes around it. You can actually do two different lines at once, so if you wanted to move a literal into W and then move that value on over to port B, you would have the flexibility to do that. You would just need to put in this slash N, which is the way in the C language you indicate an end line, the end of a particular line of code. Or it's also the inline character that would, uh, if you're trying to write something out to a terminal, would move you down to the next line in that terminal. Comments are very important in any programming language. You always want to be able to annotate your code and indicate what your thought process was, what a particular routine does, what a particular block of code does. And there's a couple ways that you can add comments in the C programming language. The first way is with a double slash, like you see here, and if you put that, everything after that double slash is a comment on the whole rest of that line. And so that's useful if you just want to comment one line, or uh, you can have several double slashes and have several lines of text. You can also have a block comment, which starts with a slash asterisk, and then anything until you get to an asterisk slash will be in comment form. So this could be within a single line, this could be over several lines, but basically anything between those two um, indicates a block comment. So that's very useful if you wanted to indicate some of the information about a subroutine, all those types of things. We'll talk a little bit more about how to document your code later on, but you should be in the practice of putting some comments in your code. You also have now access to several mathematics functions. In order to use these, you have to include the math library, so you need to add a pound include and then put math.h. That will open up several functions for you. So you have inverse trigonometry functions. So if you put in a value, it will give you back the arc cosine or the arc sine, arc tangent. Notice that it returns a double from these functions. And that double will be a value in radians. So keep in mind, it's not going to be a degree it will be a value in radians coming back from the inverse cosine, which you can easily convert over two degrees just multiplying by pi over 180 if you want that answer to be in degrees. Likewise, you can take the cosine, sine, or tangent. Again, the angles there have to be in radians, and you can do the simple conversion. You also have functions to do the absolute value, but notice that this is a little bit different than what you might be used to if you're used to MATLAB programming in that you have to specify what the return type is from these functions. So if you use abs, that is an integer-based function. It takes in an integer argument and it returns an integer value. So if you're looking at taking the absolute value of an integer that may be positive or negative, then this function is what you want to use. If you have a floating point value or a double value, you need fabs. So that stands for floating point absolute value and notice that it returns a double type. So if you wanted to take the absolute value of negative 22.4, um, if you did the integer, then that 0.4 would not work. It wouldn't be uh, encapsulated properly. If you wanted to put in a double, 
then that would work here. And also, if you wanted a long type, so if you had an integer that was a little bit bigger than your standard integer and you wanted to use the long type, then you would use labs, and that takes in a long int. I believe that also returns a long int as well. If you want to do exponents, now you have the ability to do that with the pal function, and this takes in two arguments. It's very important that you put those arguments in in the correct order. So if you put pal, whatever your f value is, and then whatever your p value is, that takes f to the p power. Okay, so it's very important that you put those in in the right order. If you swap the arguments, you're going to take p to the f power, which is probably not going to be what you want there. You also have the option to do an exponential function, that is taking the natural number e to a power, and that's just using exp with one argument here. So that will return e to whatever power you put in there, and that can be an integer or a double type. You also have the opportunity to do logarithms. So this is the natural log. You do log that way. If you want log base 10, then you have this log 10 function. You can also use some built-in macros. And what a macro is, is it's basically a way to write one line of code and then it gets converted into all the lines of code that are needed to do a particular thing. And this is very useful to create a very specific delay. So up until this point, you guys have learned how to do timing analysis and create your own delay functions. Now what we want to do is use some built-in routines in C to create our own delay with whatever time we need. And there's several different ways you can do that. If you wanted to delay a set number of clock cycles, you could just say underscore delay, and then you have an unsigned long, and you can delay for that many clock cycles. And so that could be anywhere between 0 and 6,535, the, the value that's supported by 16 bits there. If you wanted to do this, you could do underscore delay 3. Notice that this takes a char type. Remember, char is just one byte. So with it being an unsigned char, it's from 0 to 255. This delays for three times however many cycles you put in there. So this can delay from 0 up through three times 255. So that doesn't delay as long as the delay up here, but for small values you may want to use delay 3. If you're not worried about your clock cycles um, and you just want a specific time, what you can do is you can define your crystal frequency. Oop, let's go back. You can define your crystal frequency. In this case we're using a 4 megahertz clock, so we would do define underscore x tau underscore freak space 4 million. That says we're using a 4 megahertz clock and that allows us to delay for a set number of either milliseconds or microseconds. So you can put in a number here and now with one line you can delay for however many milliseconds or microseconds you want. So that's very useful if you wanted to do a stopwatch. Now you guys are going, well why didn't he teach us this earlier? Well, I wanted you to learn about the timing of your code and what better way to do that than to write a timing loop. But now, in the, the benefit of C is that you have these macros and they will do all of that work for you. So what they will do is they will generate code very similar to the delay loops that you have written before and they'll figure out how many lines of code and how many times those loops need to run to delay for the specific number of milliseconds or microseconds that you specify. So that's exactly what we just talked about. They do take the clock frequency, and so they take into account if you have a four megahertz clock, you're gonna have to run through uh, more cycles than if you had a slower clock. You're gonna have to run through less cycles than if you had a faster clock. So depending upon what clock frequency you have, the other nice thing about using these macros is if you swap out your crystal, let's say you upgraded to an eight megahertz crystal, instead of the four megahertz that we have on the board, all you would have to do in your C code is just redefine the crystal frequency and it would recalculate the delay for you without you having to go through and do all that arithmetic. So we will stop here and please watch the next video.